We're coming to your house. Have a good time. To have a good time. Woo -woo. Give you some laughter. Ha 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 ha. And happiness too. Three, four, five, six, seven. We know you can count. No mommy won't like us. No mommy won't like us. And neither will dad. And neither will dad. We're coming to your house. We're coming to stay. Whether it's Mo, Larry, and Curly, or Mo, Larry, and Shem, or Mo, Larry, and Joe Besser, or even Mo, Larry, and Curly Joe Dorita, there's no disputing that the Three Stooges are loved the world over. I'm so happy to see you. I, I... I've just been dying to meet you. If you were to add up all of the things that they gave us, like the eye poke, the around the world bop, And of course, those famous... <laughs> it's easy to see how the world of comedy would have been a poorer place without them. Sure, there have been acts with more biting humor. <laughs> and they weren't exactly matinee idols. What's going on here? Oh, 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 oh. But throughout a half-century history that included over 200 films, the Stooges have certainly left their mark on the world of comedy. So, come meet the Howards, the Fines, the Bessers, and the Doritas. Join us as we open up the Three Stooges family album. Just don't get any fingerprints on the photos. Solomon Gorovitz was born in Kovno, Lithuania. A land filled with turmoil in the late 1900s. The family knew that his only chance at the good life was to get out of Eastern Europe as quick as he could. So they packed up young Saul and his second cousin Jenny, had them quickly married and sent them off to America. The newlyweds 14 day voyage to the New World was anything but a luxury cruise. Through it all, they persevered. When they finally arrived in Castle Garden, New York, the immigration officer asked for their names. In their thick Lithuanian accents, Gorovitz sounded like Horowitz, and that would now be the family name. A couple of decades later, their famous sons, Mo, Shemp, and Curly, would change their family name to Howard. Although their marriage was arranged, Saul and Jenny would grow to love one another very much, and they quickly settled into a better life in the Bensonhurst section of Brooklyn. It was here that they gave birth to a family that would include three boys who changed the course of comedy history. Moses was the fourth child of the five brothers. He was first called Harry and later Mo. He was like any other kid in Brooklyn. He loved sports, girls, and hanging out with his buddies. The one difference between Mo and the other kids was his interest in theater. He was fascinated with acting and often played hooky to catch the shows at the melodrama theater. Mo loved everything about his childhood except for one thing, his haircut. He thought he looked like a girl. His mother loved it because she wanted a girl. Unfortunately, she never got her wish having five boys. One day, Mo did something that would change his life forever. He grabbed a pair of scissors and hacked off his curls, giving him the spittoon haircut which would become part of the Three Stooges trademark. Much to his surprise, his mother actually liked it. Of course, his brothers showed him no mercy. His biggest needler was Sam. He said, Hey, Mo, it's a little early for Halloween, isn't it? Sam's European-born mother had trouble pronouncing his name. When she said the name, it came out sounding something like Shemp. Shemp was definitely an original in name and in talent. In all of the years since, you ever heard of anybody else with the name Shemp? Underneath all of Moe and Shemp's sibling rivalry was a genuine love and respect that lasted a lifetime. Their first partnership was the purchase of a car. In 1913, they each put up about $50 for a Pope Hartford convertible. Early one morning, Shemp left the house, got behind the wheel, and started down the street. Everything was going fine until he saw a pretty girl on roller skates. He hit the brakes and then the horn. Unfortunately, he let go of the steering wheel and the car ended up going through the window of a barber shop. Fortunately, it was Sunday and no one was there. Shemp was so shaken up that he never drove a car again for the rest of his life. The youngest of the Horowitz sons was Jerome. 
so he was given the nickname Babe by Mo. He was an energetic kid who loved to sing, dance, and ride horses at the family farm. It was there that Jerome would suffer the first of a series of lifelong tragedies. One day, he was playing with a gun, and it went off accidentally. The bullet penetrated his ankle. Instead of allowing it to heal correctly, he chose to leave it be. The result was a lifelong limp. To compensate for it, he exaggerated his gait. Ironically, this became part of his comic persona that would set the world on fire just a few years later. It was during this time that Mo got his first break in show business. He landed a job on a showboat. He would gain tons of experience playing in all kinds of acts. He came back a hero and began performing with Shemp. They billed their act as Howard and Howard. In 1922, Mo ran into an old childhood friend named Ted Healy. He was now giving it a go in show business with his wife, Betty, a singer and a dancer. He asked Mo to join the act. Mo said okay, but for only a couple of days. Those two days turned into nine years. That same year, Mo met a charming young lady named Helen Schoenberger. It was love at first sight. They exchanged letters and poems and would ultimately enjoy a loving marriage that lasted almost 50 years. The same year, Shemp convinced his girlfriend Gertrude to marry him. When Shemp pours on the charm, no dame can resist him. I hope you're right. Will you marry me? <coughs> oh. One day, while Ted, Mo, and Shemp were in Chicago, they saw a young fellow working on stage with a high silk hat and tails. He was playing the violin and also acting as the MC. That man was Larry Fine. They thought his look would fit in perfectly with their act. It was a union that would last for five decades. Larry Fine was born Louis Feinberg in 1902. His dad was a jeweler in Philadelphia, and it was in his shop that Larry's future in show business was inadvertently cemented. One day, while his father was testing some metals, Larry picked up a cup of acid. Just as he was about to take a swig, his father knocked it out of his hands. Oh, a funny man. That's the matter with you. The acid burned Larry's hand badly. His arm muscles were severely damaged. His doctors suggested that he take violin lessons, thinking that the action of drawing the bow back and forth would help strengthen the muscles. A tarantula! This sparked a musical passion in Larry that would become a big part of his brilliant career in show business. In 1921, Larry landed a job on the vaudeville circuit. On the same bill was a young girl named Mabel Haney. They later starred in an act with her sister Loretta called the Haney Sisters and Fine. He was smitten with Mabel. Say, miss, would you like to get married? What? Get married. Well, I don't know, but you are kind of cute at that. They were the perfect couple and enjoyed a fulfilling marriage until Mabel's death in 1967. In their lifetime together, they had two children, Johnny and Phyllis. Here they are with a young Phyllis. In the early days, the boys did quite well in vaudeville. They sometimes performed as Ted Healy and his Southern gentlemen. Gentlemen. Gentlemen, gentlemen. We're not gentlemen. Speak for yourself. <coughs> During this period, the boys were spending an awful lot of time on the road. It was taking its toll on Mo. He missed his family and took a break from show business to be closer to them. Later that same year, his daughter Joan was born. She was his pride and joy. And while many performers had to pick career over family, Mo was definitely not one of them. He would always find the time to give her all the attention she needed and deserved. Following in his mother's footsteps, Mo dabbled in real estate for a couple of years, but he longed for the footlights and rejoined the act. Mo was back, and before long, the boys were signed to the Fox Motion Picture Studio. Here is Mo and Shemp with their first $150 check from Fox. Their first film was called Soup to Nuts. The studio thought that the boys had a bright future, so they offered them an exclusive contract. Mo wasn't happy with this arrangement. Healy was making lots of money, but only paying the boys as employees. Mo decided that they deserved a bigger piece of the action. So the boys went out on their own and formed an act called Howard, Fine, and Howard. Here they are in a rare glimpse before one of their shows at the Paramount Theater in Los Angeles. 
During this time, Mo and Shemp's families became virtually inseparable. They even practiced their act, using Mo's daughter Joan, Shemp's son Mort, and their wives as foils for their antics. Notice Mo's non-stooge haircut as Joan and Mort interrupt a midday nap. Who knows, maybe they were practicing to be makeup artists. Mo's wife Helen is not amused, neither is Shemp's wife Gertrude. The fun doesn't stop because summer's over. Here's a typical stooge stunt played to perfection by Joan and Mort. Maybe this is where the Stooges got their inspiration for those classic pie fights. Around this time, Ted Healy realized that his career was going nowhere without Mo, Larry, and Shemp. After some begging, Mo and Larry agreed to go back. But Shemp decided to strike out on his own. He was offered a part in a Joe Palooka film and thought the timing was just right to take it. He began a solo career that would include over 70 shorts and features. With Ted back with Mo and Larry, they still needed to find a third stooge. They turned to the youngest Howard brother, Jerome. The problem was that Jerome had long wavy hair and Ted didn't think he'd fit in. Jerome, who was eager to join the act, said, Wait a couple of minutes. I'll be right back. He came back almost completely bald. Promptly, his nickname was changed from Babe to Curly. self-conscious about his looks, so he would often appear in public wearing a hat. Will you please take off your hat? <laughs> Meanwhile, Shemp was still spending his time away from the screen with his family. During the early 30s, Healy and his stooges were signed to MGM. They didn't feel they were being utilized as much as they should be, so in 1934, they finally broke with Healy for the last time. They signed with Columbia Pictures and were now known as the Three Stooges. They would go on to make 190 shorts at Columbia. From the paltry sum of $150 a week, they would up their wages to as much as $7,500 a week. They were finally big hits. <laughs> Boy, with that kind of money, we could rent a one-room apartment in Hollywood. Maybe. With their newfound popularity, the boys decided to take a trip to London. Here's Mo and Curly on the dock of the great ocean liner, the Queen Mary. It seems Curly would have rather stayed on dry land. Mo was a whiz at ring toss. When they got to London, they were astounded at their reception. They were now certified worldwide hits. It was no secret that Curly was an animal lover, so the boys took a trip to the London Zoo. Here's Curly and Moe doing their best Dr. Doolittle impressions. After a long trip, Curly found the time to relax. While they were coming home, Moe took some terrific movies of the boat coming into the New York Harbor, even getting a shot of himself with the Statue of Liberty. Helen met the boat with Joan and young son Paul. They enjoyed a few days at the 1940 New York World's Fair. These years were the best of times for the Stooges and their families, and Jenny and Solomon Harwitz couldn't be prouder parents. They had a rapidly growing family, everybody's health was great, their grandkids were growing up before their eyes, and their boys were at the peak of their comedic powers. <laughs> Curly loved dogs. 
legend has it, he bought one every time he went to a pet shop. Unfortunately, many of these shops were on the opposite coast. Often there were teary goodbyes as he had to send them home. Curly also loved getting married. He was married four times. The only film that remains is of his wedding to his second wife, Elaine. Even on a sacred day like this, the boys still found time to fool around. Where is she? Maybe she got cold feet. Of course she came. Who could resist Curly? In 1946, during the filming of Half Wit's Holiday, Curly suffered the first of a series of strokes. He tried valiantly to make a comeback, but he just couldn't perform the rigorous task of being a stooge. He insisted that they go on without him. So again, they turned to a family member, Shemp. In addition to his fear of driving, Shemp had a fear of flying, so he boarded the first train to Los Angeles. He could never seem to outgrow his phobias but he sure was funny. Shemp is often considered the funniest of the Stooges. And as pretty as a picture. Yeah, but Nate, oh, get gone. Oh. The years that Shemp spent as a Stooge were some of the most prolific for the group. While he never really tried to replace Curly, he certainly brought his brand of comedy to the Stooges. I'm too young to worry and get wrinkles on my pretty little face. What we need is a little music to cheer us up. He was a comedic actor of the highest order. In Brideless Groom, his co-star, Christine McIntyre, just couldn't get up the nerve to pop him like the script instructed. Shemp said, let me have it. I'd rather get knocked around by one good one than by a bunch of little ones. She knocked Shemp right out the door. After the take, Shemp could hardly stand, but he was smiling from ear to ear, maybe because he actually liked to be hit. Like his partner, Larry, Shemp also loved the sweet science of boxing. In fact, his first stewed short, Fright Night, included a hilarious boxing sequence. It was no surprise that this was also Shemp's favorite stewed short. Curly took one last shot at performing with a bit part in Hold That Lion in 1947. This film was the only time that all three Howard brothers appeared on film together. Although Curly was not well enough to perform, he still enjoyed life to its fullest. He already had his first daughter, Marilyn, from a previous marriage, and then in 1947, he married for the last time to a caring woman named Valerie. They gave birth to a daughter named Janie. It's been said that these were some of Curly's happiest years. Here they are with Janie's dog, Salty. In January of 1952, after a brave battle, Curly Jerome Babe Howard died. He was 48. The Stooges made almost 100 shorts with Shemp. But the string would end with another family heartbreak. Boy, if I hadn't ducked, we'd have collided, sure. What a narrow escape. After a night at the fights, Shemp jumped into a cab and asked the driver to take him to his home. He was sitting in the back seat with his friend Al Winston. Al thought he smelled smoke. He looked at Shemp and noticed that he had slumped over, holding his burning cigar. Shemp had suffered a heart attack. He was dead at the age of 60. He was laid to rest at the Home Peace Cemetery, near where Curly was buried five years earlier. Of course, the Stooges' contract at Columbia called for them to perform in the face of any situation. Mo and Larry toyed with the idea of continuing on as the two Stooges, bringing in a different comedian to fill out the other prominent roles. After they realized that wouldn't work, they decided to find a replacement. Stooges director Jules White suggested comic Joe Besser. They agreed. Joe was born in 1907 in St. Louis, Missouri. He was enthralled with show business and at an early age became a good young magician. His parents were not thrilled with his decision to go into theater. They already had one son in show business, Manny. In the early 1930s, he earned a part in the Broadway show, Sons of Fun. He played the part of a whining child, a character that would become his signature throughout his career. When the Stooges called Joe, he wasn't used to the kind of slapstick comedy that the Stooges were famous for. In fact, he hated to be hit. A Stooge that didn't like to be hit? The red flag should have gone up right away. He even put in his contract a provision that prohibited Moe and Larry from slapping or causing him bodily harm. This led to some pretty funny moments, most of them involving Joe trying to hit Moe back. He was the only replacement to ever attempt it. Sure, Moe didn't like it, but it was funny, so he left it in. 
proving that he would do anything for a laugh. Joe enjoyed a private family life, often treating his job as a nine-to-fiver would. He would come in on time and knew his lines and his blocking. Although Joe and his wife didn't have any children, they treated the neighborhood kids as their own. Here's Joe and Ernie, his wife of more than 50 years. Joe's tenure with the Three Stooges may have been short, but he will always be part of the family. In 1958, Columbia decided not to pick up their option on the Three Stooges. So, after 24 years at the studio, they didn't have a contract. Of course, Columbia still owned nearly 200 stewed shorts, and they naturally sold them to TV. Joe Besser's wife was ill. Since the Stooges would now have to make more appearances than ever before, he decided not to continue as the third Stooge. After almost 30 years of continued success, the group now found itself at a crossroads. While Mo and Larry were deciding what to do, a remarkable thing happened. The television ratings for Stooge shorts were doing solid numbers. More than anything else, this told Larry and Mo that they just had to continue. For the sixth and final Stooge, they decided on Joe Dorita. Joe had known them from their earlier days at Columbia and admired their humor greatly. While Joe was in Mexico shooting the bravados, the Stooges called and he joined up soon after. Joe came up with a great idea. Like Jerome 25 years earlier, Joe cut off most of his hair and called himself Curly Joe. He took to the change immediately, but more importantly, the audiences embraced him as a stooge. Joe got an early start in showbiz. His mom ran a dancing school in Philadelphia, and at age seven, he was gracing the stages of vaudeville. He starred in a family act called the Dorita Sisters and Junior. In addition to his acting chores, Joe helped build the sets, sell the tickets, and clean up after the shows. He loved every minute of it. And with his Buster Keaton Derby, he was off to a rich, full career. Joe and Gene Sullivan had known each other professionally in the 40s and met up again in the early 60s. They took an instant liking to each other. In 1965, they finally married. It was the love of his life. The Stooges always had time for the kids. Mo, in particular, always felt that it was his duty to help as much as he could. He knew how fortunate he was to have such a loving family growing up, and when he was raising his own children, Joan and Paul. So he'd never turned down a request to appear at an orphanage or a children's hospital. The Stooges couldn't stand the sight of kids on Christmas morning with no presents to open, so they would host a huge party arriving with a car full of gifts. They loved watching the kids rip through the wrapping paper to see what Santa brought them. In their later years, the Stooges made less and less public appearances. They instead filled their time with family and friends. Larry often held court in its suite at the Knickerbocker Hotel in Hollywood. He loved to cook. When it comes to cooking, I'm gonna catch me out. Mm. In 1970, Larry suffered a stroke. Although Mo was broken up over his partner's illness, he still continued his career. He would often appear on talk shows where he'd perform old Stooge sketches. Mo knew that if he wanted to continue the Three Stooges, they'd have to find someone to replace Larry. They settled on one of their old comic foils, Emil Sitka. Around this time, Larry moved into the motion picture home. His last years were bittersweet. He loved being the focus of attention, often coming in last to dinner. A star, finally. There was always a big crowd at his table, where he talked sports and threw in a few old jokes. In mid-January of 1975, he suffered another stroke. And two weeks later, Larry was gone. Mo was heartbroken, and five months later, he too was gone. Mo was 77. Before Mo died, Curly Joe considered continuing the act, but that never happened, and Curly Joe settled into a happy retirement in his North Hollywood home. This was his last birthday party in 1993. Ironically, he would pass away in the same intensive care unit as his partner, Larry Fine. So, after more than 70 years, the world would have to get along without the Stooges. There would be no more eye pokes. Get on. No more slaps. 
And no more Christmas parties. Oh, there ain't no Santa Claus. Oh, yes, there is. We got a present for you. Ah, right Where? there. But even today, Stooge films are as popular as ever. And they finally received a star on the famous Walk of Fame on Hollywood Boulevard. Here's Joe, Moe's daughter Joan on the right, and Larry's daughter Phyllis on the left. The Three Stooges' timeless humor continues to influence many of today's comedians. It's hard to watch a comedy without seeing some remnants of a stooge bit. Yes, the passage of time can take Moe, Larry, Curly, Shemp, Joe, and Curly Joe from us. But there's one thing that could never be taken away, and that's the laughter. Please omit the rest of the entertainment and continue. I want a hippopotamus for Christmas. A hippopotamus is all I want. Don't want a doll, no dinky dinky toy. I want a hippopotamus to play with and enjoy. I want a hippopotamus for Christmas. I don't think Santa Claus will mind you. Man, that's a matter with you. 